friend of mine, actually she worked for me, works for me, and uh, she has five co-workers, all of whom are for a particular candidate for president. And, uh, and so she asked them that we plan on working the caucus for that person, and they said yes. And they said, and she asked, well, have any of you ever been to a caucus? And they said no. And then she said, you know what a caucus is? And they said no. And then she proceeded to describe what a caucus is. And all five of them said, oh, we're not doing that. Uh, so all of these polls, all of these projections, uh, to me, are irrelevant. What's relevant, and what I focused on last time, and is relevant again this time, is can you go to Iowa, can you make your case, and can you do what I did four years ago, which is to exceed expectations. And if you can exceed expectations, then you get, you get your, your, your passport stamped and you get, you get to go on the race. And um, that's what the game plan is, and I feel very comfortable, given the response I'm getting in Iowa right now, that we have an excellent chance of making that happen. With your fundraising numbers, do you think you'll make it to Iowa? Um, you know, one of the things that's, uh, that, that's great about the kind of campaign I run is I don't need a lot of money, uh, because it is, I spend about 80% of my time talking to voters. Uh, most campaigns, I think you find, uh, most of these candidates who raise a lot of money spend about 80% of their time raising money. Uh, and that's a legitimate thing to do, and it certainly gets you a lot more national attention. What I found was that raising enough money to, uh, to put money in the gas tank, have a, a robust and strong staff in the state of Iowa and in the early primary states is really what's necessary to be able to, uh, uh, to win the caucuses and then get the springboard you need to raise the money, build out the staff to be able to run a national campaign. Uh, that's what we did four years ago. I, I really don't don't think things have changed. Sure, there are more candidates, but I think the same springboard is going to happen, and uh, we just have to be prepared to, uh, to take advantage of it. Yeah. Senator, I'm sorry, I just got there a little bit later, so I have no idea if somebody else has, but could you talk a little bit about the evangelical constituency? Because when you ran in 2012, when Mike Huckabee ran in 2008, I mean, there was essentially one candidate really appealing as strongly as the two of you did to the social conservative, religious conservative constituency. Now you have a much broader field. What's it going to take to win evangelical voters? Or are they likely to be sort of splintered among these, these candidates? Well, I would just suggest that, again, four years ago, uh, yeah, there were uh, 13 candidates. But there were eight. Uh, so it's not like there was you know, one or two. And uh, there were others in that field who were very much of them in the individual. Michelle Bachman, uh, Rick Perry, uh, Gingrich, uh, Herman Cain initially. I mean, there, there was no question that all of those uh, people in the race uh, were very much targeted, in, particularly in the state of Iowa, where it's a very large set, set of voters. Uh, they, were, they were showing up at all of the events like this. There was, uh, uh, it was a very healthy competition for, uh, for these votes. And, Ultimately, over time, uh, they moved in, uh, in my direction. But look, let's be honest. A lot of other people had had a look uh, by, by these voters until they came uh, to to us. And, uh, and I think that's that's the process. I would say it's like a uh, shopping for a new car. Uh, you go into the showroom, and if there's a fancy new model there, you probably want to take it for a test spin before you hop in the suburban and drive it home. And, uh, and so we, we think we're the, uh, uh, you know, the F-150, if you will, of the, uh, the show. Senator, you, I, you were talking about Iowa, and you know, there's talk of Iowa, South Carolina, New Hampshire, always. We have 155 delegates right here in Texas. I mean, that's a huge block. What are your plans here? Uh, I actually spent a lot of, uh, a fair amount of time here. Uh, I've been here, uh, I'll be here on Wednesday night. Uh, I was here last week, and uh, I do spend a lot of time here. Uh, there are a lot of wealthy people in the state of Texas who are conservative, and it's actually one of the strongest places to be able to raise money. And uh, you know, obviously, while we're here, I mean, last week I spoke with the Northeast Aaron uh, County Party Group, uh, so we, we try to mix in, you know, speaking to uh, larger larger venues uh, as well as trying to try to raise some money. Uh, again, all of these states, once you get past the first three, are important to organize, important to to have as we do here in the state of Texas people who are working for us on the ground and helping us on a volunteer basis. Uh, but you, you have to be able to check one of those uh, first two, probably, primaries. And if you don't do well in either Iowa or New Hampshire, I mean, your chances of ever showing up in Texas are pretty small. And, and folks who have 
I decided, well, I'm going to skip the first two and focus my attention on leader primaries, tend not to get there. I think George W. Bush would tell you that the buck stops here, and that he was obviously he's going to take responsibility for anything that happens under his presidency. I was in the Senate. I take responsibility for what happened uh, during that time, and we work very, dil very diligently afterward to make sure that we uh, we never repeat that mistake. Uh, it was a um, it was an attack that you look at, at the intelligence. Maybe had we had a little different view of intelligence and a better understanding of how terrorism terrorism worked. We would have been able to, uh, the intelligence community would have been able to put something together that could have prevented it. Uh, so I think George Bush would tell you, George W. Bush would tell you, yeah, I take responsibility. Um, and he also took responsibility for, uh, for getting the people who, uh, who, who launched that attack. But to suggest or maybe imply uh, that it was sort of his fault, uh, that, that there was something that, uh, that he did or actions he took that led to that, I think, I'm not sure that's what. Trump is saying, I think that's what the media is trying to try to stoke up. Uh, I, I don't think he's saying that. I hope he's not suggesting that anymore. That he would suggest that uh, somehow we were, you know, somehow complicitly. This was a uh, was a new threat, a threat that uh, hopefully we learned from uh, the experience, a horrible experience that we had to endure. Mr. Senator, as a senior in high school, the cost of higher education is continually rising. If you were elected to office, what programs or policies would you enact? to make sure that an easy education is accessible for everyone? Well, uh, what, we've, what we've done as a federal government in, in providing uh, grants and loans uh, is uh, dramatically increase the cost of education. There's two areas of the economy that have grown faster than the rest of the economy above the rate of inflation. It's health care and it's in higher education. Both of them are heavily subsidized by the federal government. And so you have the Democratic candidates up there promising free this and free that, uh, as if uh, there's all the money in the world to pay it and no, and, and no one ultimately is going to end up paying this. 74% per, uh, percent of Americans don't have a college degree. So what are we going to do? We're going to ask them to pay higher taxes so we can send 26% of Americans to college and pay for their college for free? Uh, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's what, uh, what the federal government should be doing. I think there's a tremendous advantage uh, and a tremendous benefit for people to go to college. Uh, and that they should, uh, they should participate in the cost of that uh, because they, they get a tremendous benefit uh, economically from it. And we shouldn't be charging people who don't have that college experience for the cost of the education that's going to improve your economic lot in life. And so uh, the really the better question is how do consumers of higher education do a better job at minimizing the cost of that higher education? I have a son right now who's in college, he's a four-year college, but he's taking a semester and he's going to community college. At, I would have one tenth of the price, uh, and that is a nice break for dad. Uh, it's a nice break for him because he shares in the cost of, of, of providing this education. And I think you're going to start to see more and more people look at more practical ways of getting an a, a, a associate's or, or, or four-year degree than paying a full boat at a very very expensive school and having you know a couple hundred thousand dollars of loans or more when you come out of college. Senator, so many voters say they're looking for an outsider to uh, choose for president. Um, with your record in the Senate, do you fit that problem? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the outsider who knows what to do on the inside. And I came to the United States Congress, and ultimately we put the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in jail. We uh, threw out the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, I came to the Congress, and the, the Republicans have been in the minority for 37 years. And I didn't come there to be in the minority. And I decided to, uh, to go there and do what you know, some, some House and Senate members are trying to do right now, shake things up. Here's the difference. I won. That's, that's a big difference. There's, a, there's one thing to go out there and say you're going to fight all these battles and lose them. It's another thing to go out and fight all these battles and win them. And we won battles. We took on the establishment. Uh, we, uh, we put forth ideas uh, that had support not just within our ranks, but could, could garner bipartisan support. I talked about that downstairs. And they were, they were ideas that, that allowed bipartisanship to happen. They were, they were new, bold, better ideas of how to do something 
without, uh, without sort of the, the hard edge rancor that you see in Washington, D.C. today. So I would say the best way to, to find someone who's uh, going to clean things up is to find someone who actually did clean things up, actually did win, and move, and move, this, uh, move the country forward. Uh, and that's why I, I said, you know, if you're looking for an outsider who has the knowledge and ability to accomplish something on the inside, there's really only one candidate that's raised that fits that criteria, and that's why I'm asking for vote for support. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, in the past you criticized the public school system and promoted public school education. As President of the United States, how would you promote the public school system? Yeah, I've written actually a couple of books where I, where I touch on, on a lot of that and the, the problems that within our, uh, our public education system. Uh, you know, I, I've come to the conclusion, I say this in my books, I came to the conclusion that the, uh, the, problem, the biggest problem that we have in our public education system is the fact that so many of our children are coming to school unprepared to learn. And it goes back to what Jack and I were talking to downstairs, which is the breakdown of the family. And if we don't do something to, uh, to, to re-knit the American family and create a more stable uh, home, one that encourages and rewards and learning and preparedness to come to the school with the ability. And we point the finger, look, there are a lot of problems with public education, and we point the fingers at administrators and teachers. But the bottom line is that uh, we've seen a dramatic expansion of the federal government's role in education in the last 20 years. When I came to Congress, uh, the federal government spent 2% of their, of, of, of all of education spending, primary and secondary, 2% was the federal government. Now it's 11%. And with every single percent comes a whole host of strains that teachers have to fill out paperwork and administrators have to do this with the money. And I think it's been a disaster. I'm for repealing all of those, uh, those programs. Let the school districts be run by the local level, have more parental involvement in education, give parents a stake in the, in, in, in the program, give them a stake in the school, give, give, tie them in. And, and you say, well, a lot of parents won't want to. Yeah, but a lot of parents will. And, and we, need to, we need to change the dynamic of engaging parents because the school system is there for the parents. And that's a shock to a lot of people. Why? Because it's the parents' responsibility to educate their children, not the school district. The school district there is help the parents. And right now, parents are pretty much kept out of the system, not in the really good schools, but in many schools. So we need to get the federal government out, bring parents in, and, and work to try to get the home to be a better place to uh, to hand off the child and have a more collaborative relationship with the school in that process. Are you take one more. Are you surprised at how much attention immigration has gotten this time around, uh, this early on? I wish it would get more attention because it's probably the issue that divides the Republicans in the field more than any other issue. Uh, I mean, if you look at everybody in the field, there's a there's a survey that was done. That the only organization that I've seen that actually has done a survey of all the Republican candidates, and by the way, the Democratic candidates on the issue of immigration. It's a group called Numbers USA and the coalition called FAIR, and you can go to numbersusa.com. And there's only one candidate in the field that has an A rating, Republican or Democratic, according to that group. Uh, and that's a group that focuses in on making sure that the immigration system in our country is actually consistent with what the purpose of an immigration system is. And I would make the argument that the purpose of an immigration system is to do is to bring people enough people into this country that's in the best interest of the United States of America. That's what our immigration system should be about. It should be about doing what's best for America and Americans who are uh, who are impacted by the issue of immigration. I don't think we should pass laws that are not in the best interest of America. Does anybody agree that we shouldn't pass laws that are not in the best interest of America? So this group said is is looked it looked at as I have. The, the immigration system in our country, and not looked at it from the standpoint of people who have broken the law, what are we going to do about that? But the standpoint from people who have not broken the law and are impacted by the immigration system. That sort of makes, seems to make the sense as that should be the focal point of the discussion on immigration. And the reality is that we've brought in 35 million people into this country over the last 20 years, 90% of whom are wage earners. And so when you look at an immigration system, you think, well, logically, who should we look at to see who is most impacted? Wage earners. And what is the state of wage earners in America today? Well, we have wage growth, the lowest in, in, over the last 20 years is the lowest wage growth in any 20-year period in American history. 
fact, the last quarter was the lowest wage growth ever recorded in American history. We have, since the year 2000, the last 15 years, 5.7 million net new jobs created between 2000 and 2014. And of those net new jobs created, 5.7 million, every single one of those jobs is held by someone who wasn't born in this country. In fact, there are fewer native-born Americans working today than there was 15 years ago. So when you look at those facts, and you say, well, we're bringing in a million fifty thousand immigrants a year legally, 700,000 illegally last year. We don't enforce our laws, and American workers are frustrated, angry, a la some of the reaction you're getting in the Republican primary right now. The Democratic Party focusing on minimum wage. Why? Because wage growth stinks. Why? Because wages are being competed for by the very people that the Democratic Party wants to bring into this country in droves. Which, is, which are wage earners who are both legal and illegal immigrants. And so I think it is a hugely important issue for American workers. If you want to do something, I hear the Democrats scream and holler about the, 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 the gap in America and the, the separation of rich and poor. They're causing part of that by the unlimited immigration that they're bringing into this country and uh, the, uh, the stifling of the economy. It's a one-two punch. We need someone who understands what American workers are facing and have an immigration policy that's in their best interest and a tax and regulatory policy that creates opportunities for workers to be able to get good paying jobs and rise. That's why, that's why I'm running for president. I announced from a factory floor, and if we want to win Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, you go across the rust belt of America, where that impact is being felt the most, that's where the opportunity is for us to win this election. And that's why I'm asking for votes for folks down here in Texas. Thank you very much.